Read aloud time is one of my favorite times in my classroom. Um, I love reading stories with my kids. I love getting really into the character. I feel like this is my moment to almost be that actress <laughs> that every little girl wants to end up being. All right, maybe never, not every little girl. And maybe it wasn't even my dream, but it's still really, really fun to be able to get into that character. Uh, and I have always, always, always for the past several years really wanted to have some way to be able to track um, the character and the plot because it's a great opportunity for me to uh, embed the skills that we are learning during our reading time into our read aloud time. Now for me, my read aloud time and my reading, my ELA block are two separate entities. So I have my ELA time in the morning and then I have read aloud at the very end of the day, which is like perfect for us um, because it's a great way to just kind of ease off and then everybody just kind of gets really quiet and they get really into the story. Uh, so I have like I said, always wanted a way to be able to track those characters, to be able to track the plot line, uh, to record theories and to record the theme, things that I feel like we want to constantly keep coming back, but I also want to be able to model it for my students on how do you go out and uh, do this with a chapter book? Like, how do you do these skills with a chapter book? Because that's a really, really hard thing to learn. Um, learning them in the very beginning, starting off small, that scaffolding piece with those picture books and those short stories, like that's how we kind of build that understanding of each of these skills. But then to take it to the next level and embed it into a chapter book, wow, it's like really, really difficult for kids. So, I like to be able to model that for my kids. Now, there are some teachers that think, well, I'm just gonna have them do more work. I don't want them to do the more work. I don't want to make more work out of read aloud because read aloud is meant to be conversational. Um, stories are meant to be conversational. You're supposed to have those conversation with your kids to get them thinking and to get them wondering things. So. I didn't want to give them extra things. I didn't want to say, here's a plot line now, I want you to track it. Or after every chapter, I want you to sit down and I want you to write something. That's not necessarily what my read aloud time is for. Now, later on in the year, towards the very end, when we start doing more of those book clubs and those book studies, um, then we're gonna have the opportunity to be able to explore those possibilities where the kids get to do more of the work. But right now, this is me modeling all of that. So I finally did it. <laughs> Guys, I finally went through and I created my read aloud tracker. Now I wanted this to be something that I could use every single with every single book. Um, I wanted to be pretty easy, but I also wanted to be pretty interesting and fun um, to be able to grab kids' attentions. And I wanted it to have different parts to it. So um, I thought about all of the different elements that I wanted. Of course, I wanted a place to be able to put the characters, the character theories that we end up collecting as we read. Um, I wanted to be able to track the types of conflict because as we know in chapter books, there's not just one conflict. Yeah, there's a conflict between the antagonist and the protagonist, but there's lots of conflict. Um, a really good example of this is in the story night books that we're currently reading. Um, the character Alex has, con has character versus self-conflict because he thinks that he is this weird person, that he's this like what they term freakazoid in the book. Um, and so that oftentimes will come up. So we wanna be able to track all of the different types of conflict that are occurring within that text, but then we also want to track the conflict that's going on between the protagonist and the antagonist. So I wanted those elements inside of it. I did want the theme. I wanted to be able to track the rising action. For me, I truly believe that the rising action is one of the most difficult things for kids to understand because they want to tell you everything. Everything is important to them. So getting them to kind of identify, okay, how is the author trying to build that tension? Where is the suspense happening? Where are those big moments kind of coming from? Not necessarily those little bitty things that are occurring along the way, but it's just kind of a big overarching moment that's happening. So I'm going to reference my book again that I'm reading, um, Night Books. And in this book, they have a moment where um, Alex is trying to 
help Yasmin, which is another character, which later on, if you're a sixth grade teacher, you can refer to this as your guide. Um, and this guide essentially needs help. Um, and so it's a big moment in the book. And that's going to be a part where we say that that's a rising action. You know, it builds tension. There's something going on. And it's a really, really big moment for them um, as characters to try to build that bond together. So I wanted to incorporate all of those pieces. I wanted it to be something that was also really easy for me. Um, I didn't want to have a ton of extra work where I had to create something new for every single book. So I laminated a bunch of the um, parts that I ended up creating. Um, and if you are curious and you want to grab hold of these parts, I am going to have two different versions. I have the colorful version, which is what you see behind me. But then I have a version that you can just print out onto AstroBright paper. So I laminated them and then I ended up placing them. The first time that I placed them, I had the characters up top. And I'll be honest with you guys, like in the beginning, I was like, I want them up there because I want them to be the focal point, right? Um, and I decided to move it around. I didn't really love the way things looked. And so I started changing the layout a little bit more. And one really great way to do this is just by using little pins. Pin things up where you think you want them to go and move them around. Currently, right now, I still have my and pins and I think I'm gonna leave them that way um, until we get done with this book that we're doing together and then after I kind of feel good about where everything's positioned I'm gonna go ahead and staple, staple it into the um, onto the board itself that way it doesn't end up moving around so once I had my placement, I um, used some ribbon in order to do the plot line um, on the very back. And it was very, very simple. Like it's all one piece. And I just kind of twisted and like pulled it up and it worked out great. So I created that with the plot line. I have the different elements um, in some different shapes to really kind of stand out on this like bulletin board itself. Um, and then I ended up putting the types of conflict off to the side. Now I had to do this for two different reasons. Well, the biggest reason is because it didn't fit on my board. There was absolutely no, no room, but I also am just going to use sticky notes um, to be able to track the types of conflict. So as we're identifying those conflicts, we're going to write it onto a sticky note and then we're going to place it up here. One of the other things that I really liked about this interactive board is that I also got the kids involved with this. Now you can get kids to be able to write everything up and to be able to track them themselves using those sticky notes if you wanted to. But I also went a little bit further than that and I had the kids, because I have a lot of artsy kids, they uh, ended up drawing the characters. Now this is a really great way to be able to pull extrinsic characteristics and talk to kids about extrinsic characteristics and how we all kind of view characters a little bit different. I often tell teachers this is like that time when everybody was reading the Twilight series and we all had like a vision of Edward in our heads and then all of a sudden when Twilight came out as a movie it was like, oh, I didn't really have him pictured like that, but all right, like it works. Like I felt like I was really disappointed because the Edward in my head did not match the Edward in the movie, but to each their own. <laughs> so I went on ahead and had the kids do that. And then I laminated those and I cut them out to be able to place them next to their little characters. And so the entire idea is that as little bits and pieces come to the, to, to, um, in the story, when you're reading, you want to stop. You want to have those conversations with your kids. You want them to engage in what's going on. You want them to think about, well, where are we in this story? What's kind of, where's, where's the tension happening? What's the conflict? What's the, you know, what's happening to the characters? How is the character changing at this point? And this is a great way to be able to track it. Now, I am a little excited because I also did, um, now, Right now, as I am recording this, um, my kids cannot do a lot of walking around. So to be able to um, kind of match this, I've created a jam board that will match all of these different pieces. So if you wanted to do this, whether you are teaching virtually or maybe you just don't want your kids all walking around and you want to give them the opportunity to do it independently, it's not so much work because you're not going to maybe hit this every single day. It's only during those big moments that you're really going to pay attention to the board but it gives them an opportunity to be able to track it onto their own jam boards. So I also have that that's going to be going along with it and the kids are going to be working in their jam 
jam boards as well, which is going to be very exciting. So I wanted to share a little bit of an update because I made a few changes. I mentioned in the original video that I was going to have a black and white version that you could print onto Astro Bright's paper. Now I have to be honest guys, this is going to be the, the version that I personally think looks visually the best on a board. But if you are one that doesn't have that, you'd rather do it on the colored printer, you're still going to have that option available. But this one is going to be my, my favorite. So here's what the board looks like now. I did go ahead and fix the top of it. Uh, but you're going to notice that I have all of my um, different components for plots and just what we want to track for our read aloud. Um, I have it printed onto Astro Bright's paper. I did laminate it. Um, so that we could just easily be able to wa wipe them off. And then I went on ahead and made it permanent by stapling it to my board itself. So basically, Alex says that he wants to try and get rid of his MacBooks. How does he feel about that? Like, how does he feel about himself? Kaylin, how does he feel about himself? Yeah, so that's a really good theory that we can have about him, right? Because of the fact that he wanted to get rid of something that was so precious to him, he has pretty low self-esteem. So one of the things that I'm going to write for his theories is low self-esteem. Low self-esteem. Okay? So that's another theory that I can have for him. Now, I said that one of the conflicts because there are lots of different types of conflicts that we can have. Can I get your eyes up for a second? Actually, if you go to um, your third page, you have a conflict tracker right there. So these are all of the types of conflict that we're going to talk about this year. So one of the first ones is character versus self. And I went on ahead and I have a sticky note here that has character versus self. And what I wrote on it is that Alex really struggles with himself, doesn't he? Because of that self-esteem, he really thinks that he's not normal in so many ways. So one of the things on one of those sticky notes, you can tap into that little sticky note, it should be able to have you type. Woo -woo! Yay, we got something right, guys. So what I want you to type in there is just that Alex has a struggle with himself because he doesn't think that he's normal. He has a struggle with himself because he doesn't think that he's normal. Um, I don't really, like, go into, like, like, now, a lot of people think that there's really going to just be one type of conflict that happens in the story. Well, there is a main conflict. There's one big piece of conflict, but there can be lots of little conflicts that happen throughout. Because I want you to think about this plot map here. It actually has lots of ups and downs. There are a lot of up and down moments, right? Lots of little problems that start to kind of build that tension to you, so that when you get to the climax, you're like on the edge of your seat. So there's going to be lots of parts where we're dealing with other types of conflict here. So just now, we finished up one of the chapters, actually yesterday, where he was dealing with the little, what are those things called? The dangler. The danglers, thank you. Danglers. So he was dealing with those danglers. Now, if you're looking at your conflict tracker, what type of conflict would that have been? Say it. Supernatural. He was dealing with the supernatural in that point. So there, you can even say that he had a conflict with the little danglers and one part because that was like its own little storyline wasn't it in some way so that play is all played out all by itself there was a resolution there was a climax there were all these little parts if you think about that one chapter it was a whole plot line in and of itself that's why in a big piece of plot we can go up and down and up and down and up and down constantly before we ever get to the climax so that's one small we have two so far we have his conflict, his struggle with himself. We have the struggle with the supernatural. And then now we have this big main conflict. What's the main conflict? Think about protagonist and antagonist. What's our main conflict, Isla? 
character versus character. So we had uh, Alex versus Natasha. And with Alex versus Natasha, what is the big problem that's happening? What's the big problem, Kaylin? Um, Natasha kidnapped him and he's trying to escape with you. Right, she's holding him captive in her magical apartment. So here, where I have my conflict, I can put Natasha holds Alex captive. She holds him prisoner in her apartment, right? So that would be our big main conflict, but we're going to have lots of little conflicts throughout the story. And we can track them on our conflict tracker. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, what about Yasmin? What do we know about her? What do we know about her? Go ahead. She's been trapped a lot longer than Alex. Yeah, she's definitely been trapped a lot longer. We don't really know how long she's been trapped, but we do know that she's been trapped a lot longer. So one of the what else can we say about Yasmin? Go ahead. Say it again. She was lured in with one of her favorite foods. Okay, so what can we maybe develop as a theory about her? Go ahead. Maybe the unicorn girl. No, think about it. You were just talking about foods. What is the theory that we can come up with? She was like the food and she was very now. Can you please stop? She was like the and she was lured in from food. Yeah, so she might like foods because we also know that she's a what? What does she do? Yeah, she's a good cook. So one theory that we can have about Yasmin is that she loves cooking, right? Yep. So I'm going to add that there. Loves cooking. Okay, now we talked about this um, one day with Natasha. What about Natasha? What can we say about her with theories? What are some theories that we can say about her? Think about what we've learned, what we've heard her say, what can we kind of say in general about her? Huh? She's a witch. What else? Go ahead. She's selfish. She's very selfish. Um, she's rude. She is rude. Absolutely. Say it loud and proud, baby. She traps kids up in her apartment and makes them read some stories. Okay, yeah. She likes to trap kids and she likes for them to read stories. So if she likes for kids to, she traps kids to read stories to her, we can say that she likes what? To read. She likes what type of stories? She likes scary stories. So a theory that we can write about Natasha is that she likes scary stories. So I'm going to write that down as one of my theories. She likes scary what else can we say about her? We talked about the apartment a little bit the other day and about what Alex said the apartment looked like. He said it looked very what? Say it. Old fashioned, right? It was very old fashioned. Just the stuff that was in there is very old fashioned. So what theory could we have about Natasha? That she's what? Very old. Now, so some of the things that we talked about with the setting here, we said that it was old fashioned. Um, it was old fashioned, it was an apartment. What else did we say? What else did we say about it? She's a witch. She is a witch, but we're on the setting now. It was like alive? It was alive. 
the apartment is somehow, and I'm going to put it in quotation marks, it's alive. It's alive. Does this help give you a really good view of kind of what this storyline is looking like? As you start to get into sixth grade, guys, you will be asked to start working more with chapter books and being able to apply your plot to chapter books. It's not as easy. So this is going to be really helpful as we start to do and practice some of this together so that when you get prepared for sixth grade, you're going to have to be more confident to be able to find the elements of plot and all of those different pieces in a storyline. Does that make sense? So this is to hopefully prepare you for that. Okay, so here's what I will do for you. I will let you have the last 12 minutes just to make a free choice because I know that we've had lots of technology issues. If you're able to, I would like for you to fill in some of the pieces that we talked about, okay? Please try and fill some of those pieces in. You guys are going to have to forgive me because the bells are ringing. It's the very end of the day. All of my students are gone, so I figured I would film this this clip. Um, so I went on ahead and made those changes. I personally like the way it looks a little bit better than having the white. I think, I think that the white was just a little bit too white for me. It just kind of looked like a little bit of an eyesore. Um, I like this version way better. Now, I also have the Jamboard. We did work with the Jamboard a little bit today. Um, some of my students were having issues as far as with their iPads and being able to um, make edits to that Jamboard. You can do it anyway. You really have three options. One, you have a Jamboard that you can project and share with your student so that they can just see it. Um, second, you can share it with your students and have it up. Um, and each of the kids can kind of contribute where they want to contribute. And the last one is the way that I'm doing it, where I give my kids a copy of the Jamboard so that they keep it in their own Google Drives and that they make their own personal edits. I'll have them submit that Jamboard to me at the very end of our read aloud um, and use that as just, um, are they truly understanding what we're talking about and what we're reading? So I like this. Look, look, look how cute that looks. I feel like the colors are very me, and that's what's really nice about the black and white version, is that you can pick any colors with Astro Brights that really kind of fit the theme of your classroom. I'm a blues and greens kind of girl. I just always have been, and so that's kind of what I ended up sticking with. Um, and then I have the types of conflict there that you can also uh, print out onto colored paper. But yeah, I hope that you guys enjoyed this. I figured I'd go ahead and add this little clip in there. Um, so... That is going to be all linked down in the description box if you're a little bit curious. I hope you enjoyed this entire process of making a bulletin board, one that's a little bit more interactive versus one that's just a visual piece in your classroom. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't and hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time I post a video or I go live. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all next time. Bye!